we are presenting to you this afternoon the word and you that which was and is and that which shall be we would hate to stop on a dime in the arc of time we would really not want to stop right where we are now and not go on we would hate to live in past history if we were a prisoner of past history we would not want to live in present history if we were a prisoner in present history nor would we want a future in which we would stop when nothing would continue to happen infinity is not that infinity is not where the top runs down and everything stops and topples over and is no more infinity is so vast a network of spirals and wonderful possibilities that only the Godhead could conceive of infinity and understand it in our finite mind in our carnal mind we are not able to grasp infinity we grasp segments of it however we call these segments time for the little piece of pie that is our life is really just a very small piece of a larger pie and then above that stacked in space ad infinitum are more pies more circles more potentials and so we should cease to stop on a dime we should not just put on the brakes and think that everything is going to continue as it was when we first came into this world you know the village smithy and the spreading chestnut tree you know the old rubber tire that we used to hang from a tree and swing in well the old days are going for many people yet they're beginning for others little children come into the world and they have their toys and their periods of immaturity but as adults or as becoming adults we are growing up and in a spiritual sense we have to learn to affinitize our mind with the word that was that is and that is to come to understand what it is that lives in us that has lived in past history and has undergone great experimentation and great experience in the world we have lived before i do not believe that any person here has not lived before and in that former life or lives that we have lived we have had sad and glad experiences both this is proven true in most cases in this life sometimes we really learn more from the sad experiences than we do from the glad experiences because often the glad experiences are really all sand and foam they're just something on the surface of life i'm talking about the glad experiences but we really have to struggle to cope with our sad experiences and master them we have to learn to rise above our handicaps our handicaps with people our handicaps with things our handicaps with conditions our handicaps that we face in the world that we meet almost daily many of these we do not consider handicaps they're just nuisances inconveniences in living who was it said in your patience possess your soul and what is really important or most important is the possession of our soul and so when we look back at what was in former history we must recognize that at the time that it happened it was all that mankind had no they didn't have television 
not 100 years ago. They didn't have shiny motor cars and sleek assembly line productions. They didn't have all the type of houses that were shown at Expo. In other words, there was a great deal that now exists in our world that in the past did not exist. And yet, our grandfathers, our forebears were able to successfully cope with many, many, many situations and evolve technologies and theologies and all types of ologies that are utilized by us in part today. So we come down now to the particular pointer of the present, right this minute. And here we are, but we are unable to stop on the dime because the sands of time never stop in the glass. They're always falling. And therefore, if you don't like the clothing of the moment, you may take it off and put on new garments for the new age. Do you understand that? We are able to be clothed upon with the garments that we want. There's some people that like to kid themselves. They want to have their cake and they want to eat their cake too. They want to put one hand nestled into God's hand and the other hand in the hand of the world. They don't want to miss anything, do they? I don't really think that the world, as I like to think of the world, the world of trees and forests and streams and blue sky and all that nature holds is the world that Christ talked about. When he said friendship with the world is enmity with God, he was talking about a mode of life, about a way of life. It's the way people live today and the way they have lived in past ages that has been wrong. It's not nature that has been wrong. Living the natural life is quite all right. It is quite wonderful. It is as God intended. And we hear people all the time talking about pie in the sky ideas. They talk about the promises of how wonderful it's going to be up in heaven. Why, we can have heaven right here on earth if we would just shift our emphasis from the present day standard of a rat race, which is what's going on right now in the world. I saw a woman 15 or 20 years ago in a small town in the Midwest get on a bus. It was a country bus stop. And the woman was frightened. She didn't have a nickel to pay her bus fare. And she knew she had to be downtown. There was something very important that she had to go downtown for. She was six miles out in the country. It was a hot day and she couldn't walk it. So she got on the bus and the bus was driven by a man I knew. A man who lived in a comfortable little home. It was quite a beautiful home. He had a flower garden and he went to church every Sunday and he had a lot of respect from the people in the community. But how he enjoyed the little incident of embarrassing the woman and catching her in her fumbling in her purse for her bus token and then sitting down one seat back and then moving back another seat and wiggling out of the way, hoping that he would forget that she existed and thus carry her to town. Now the average person today has never been placed in this predicament. Most of us have been able to eke out a living or we have been able to have our bus tokens and funds for the things that we need. Although I was raised during the Depression when it was extremely difficult for an individual to be able to get many of the necessary functions of life. 
But this poor woman, she got on and she was frightened almost out of her skin because he called her. He said, I want that fair. She said, well, just a minute, I'm finding it in my purse. And she borrowed another six or seven minutes. Well, he put her off two miles from town. And there she was, the pitiful, helpless little thing. I was a very young man at the time that this happened many years ago. I don't know why nobody in the bus thought about it, but they could have very well put her fare in. It was only 15 cents. But none of us had enough sense, including me, to think at the time, well, we better go forward and stick the 15 cents in for the lady. This gives us a little idea of what many people are facing in this world today. They are face to face with situations that more or less put them into a compromising position where they think they have to do something to deceive other people. And it doesn't always work. But I knew the man who was the driver. I wonder how many times in the 20 years he drove bus that he had to put a woman off the bus. I doubt, very much doubt, if this probably would happen more than once a year. But he couldn't take 15 cents out of his own pocket and say, well, look, lady, just be at peace. I'll take care of it for you this time. You see, the milk of human kindness does not run in the streets. In fact, I'm not sure you can even buy it in the marketplace. I could tell you stories all afternoon of human cruelty that I have seen in my travels, including a fallen woman and a fallen man in New York City who fell off the subway train and the whole train load of people walked over them and nobody would pick them up. One of them was bleeding from the nose and no one would turn them over. It took the police 20 minutes to a half hour to get there, but nobody wanted to become involved. We are living in a time today where our civilization has become synthetic through and through. The whole fabric of it is synthetic. It's shoddy, it's shameful, it's disgraceful. And yet we call this an age of reason. The word that was, was from the foundation of this world. And the word that was must have had and have today the power and intelligence to be able to communicate to the children of God upon this planet something of the meaning of being the Good Samaritan, of understanding what it means to be your brother's keeper. And yet that milk is very scarce as a commodity upon the marketplace the milk of human kindness. We find individuals all over the world who are very kind and very thoughtful of others who may be in various positions of need. But good Samaritans are really not in abundance in the world. I recognize one aspect of this problem that I want to discuss with you briefly because this is not the subject of the whole lecture by any means. And that is that there are many people today in the world who are not willing to work. They want to put their hand out and they want someone else to fill it. This also is just as bad, 100% as bad as someone refusing to help another person. Both these qualities are wrong. The quality of expecting that the world owes us a living and not being willing to contribute to the world and the quality of saying, well, I'm smug and I'm comfortable and I've worked for what I have and I'm not going to give it away. I believe there is a time to give to anyone who asks and there is a time to withhold. And God help us to know what that right time is. Because none of us should enjoy the karma that we would be making by refusing to be our brother's keeper. In the land of India, we had 
countless hands out all over. And all the hands would always point to their mouth and then rub their stomach. We found out that some of them were practically sons of Maharajas who were out on the street begging because it was popular. Isn't this true? Yes, some of them I learned over there were the sons of wealthy people. And begging became a popular sport. They used to go downtown and beg from people. Well, it's a matter of discrimination. Some of our pilgrims that went with us to India, they opened their purse strings and said, rupees, rupees, rupees. And why, it was just like feeding chickens in the barnyard. Everybody was coming running, you know, to get the rupees. But some of them were worthy and some were not. I believe that it's probably, if possible, very important that you discriminate and try to give to those that really need and not waste it on those who don't. So you always have a problem. You have a problem if you own anything and you have a problem if you don't own anything. Here we are, the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear, the Master says, what we shall be. And we have paupery in our world, and we have sickness, and we have affliction, and we have trouble. Now the Master Jesus covered this subject very well the time the woman came along to him and poured a huge box of ointment of spicknard over his feet. It was a very costly item. And of course the disciples, they were very zealous men and very concerned for their fellow men. And so some of them came up and said, well now, couldn't this ointment actually be sold? And couldn't the money from the sale of the ointment have been used to feed the poor? What did the master say? He said, the poor you have with you always, but me ye do not have with you always. The thing you have to recognize is a matter of value. Otherwise, our consciousness can be diverted by the poverty scene, by the problem scene, by human sympathy, by the afflictions that people make. For in reality, everybody makes their own problem. And in the world that was, as well as the world that is, we have to deal with that. And we will have that problem with us in the world that is to be. You and I create our own problems. I'm going to tell you why, from the master's viewpoint, it's impossible to support communism. Well, under communism, you see, you're supposed to take the wealth and divide it up, and everybody's supposed to get a chunk, an equal chunk of the wealth. If we did it now, they tell me in our country that everybody would have less than a dollar. I don't know how this is possible, but I guess the number of people that are here, it probably is possible. So we have to think about the situation involving karma. There isn't a single person in this nation that is not creating good or bad karma all the time. The minute you get up in the morning, you start creating a certain amount of karma. Sometimes it's real good karma if you do well. And if you do the wrong thing, it's bad karma. Well, you were doing that same thing a thousand years ago. And so was everybody else. We were doing it 10,000 years ago. And so the point is, today humanity is reaping what they have sown in the past. And our future will be a time also of reaping what we sow in the present. And that is why the people who take interest in the Ascended Master teachings are the wisest people on the face of this earth. And I don't care how you look at it, because they understand the divine plan. And Christ said of this door, few there be that find it. That is true of the brotherhood and always has been. How wonderful it would be if everybody could obtain grasp at the time they were born. 
when they drew the first breath in, if people had the knowledge of God imparted to them. Yet what does it say in the scriptures? I will write my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. God has done that, and I have a very strange belief. I believe that people know a good deal more about the wrongs they do than they're willing to admit. I believe that people often rationalize. And when they're doing something that is not right, down inside of themselves, they feel that. They have a very definite feeling that they're doing the wrong thing, and yet they keep right on doing it. The question is why? Why do they keep on doing it? Because somehow or other, we are not able to focalize and obtain perspective, the perspective of pure reason. In other words, as the Master has said, if we knew better, we would do better. And it boils down to that. A class such as this has many purposes. The Masters do many things for us at the conference. And during the lectures, we give many pieces of vital information. But no information is of any value if it is not used. And therefore, the most important thing we can do is to try to make these practical teachings part of our personal life throughout the year and years. It would be very easy to just chuck all the divine things overboard and say, oh well, I'm in this world to have fun, and I'm going to have fun. Let's go out and have fun. That's the attitude of the world today, and this attitude was spoken of by the writers of the Gospels. They say, let us eat, let us drink, for tomorrow we die. They do not have any more faith in life than that. They think life is just a bowl of jelly, let's shake it. Isn't it true? But it isn't. It's really a very wonderful thing. The late Khalil Gibra in the prophet said, Now thought is ever a bird of space, which in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. We should comprehend the meaning of the opportunities of shedding the milk of human kindness of which I spoke at first. Because the Good Samaritan, in effect, was a story of Christ himself. And we all may share in it as we live it. Cal Elgebra also said, speak to your neighbor when you meet him in the marketplace and be kind to him. For he will remember your words even as one remembers the color of the wine when the taste is forgotten and the vessel is no more. The word that was is with us still. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the ascended master Consciousness, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The consciousness of life, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You have the same life in you that you had in yourself when you first drew breath in your first embodiment. Now, a lot of people don't understand that they have probably lived on this earth from 50 to 100 times and maybe more maybe 500 times. It doesn't matter. And you have the same flame of God in you right now that you had when you first drew breath. And when you make your ascension, when you ascend back to the heart of God, when you have freedom from fear, and you go back to the arms of the Father, at that moment, the same flame is going to be in you that you have right now. So that flame is pretty important. In a way, that is your identity. That's you. 
that's distinctive from every other soul in the universe. And that's a part of God. One of the great masters once held up a drop of water on the end of his finger. And the drop of water shone as a little diamond in the sunlight. And the man who was listening to the master looked at it. And it looked like a rainbow color shining right through that drop of water. That was the reflection of the light from without. The master said, this is a part of the infinite ocean. This is your soul. This is the real you. It's an unseparated part of that ocean. You can never separate it from the ocean even though you hold it on your finger because it's a part of the ocean. And that is the way with every human being. We are a part of the living God now. We are a part of the word that was, the word that is, and the word that is to come. In studying the revelations of John on the Isle of Patmos, we read about the beast that was, that is, and that is to come. And this, of course, is a revelation of the God that became the man, that became the beast, that became the man, that became the God. Because man has gone through various phases of evolution. He was one with God without individualized consciousness, possessing collective consciousness, the collective of the Godhead. So the Godhead gave him his prodigal opportunity. He said, you want to go down to have your inheritance and be an individual? Go right ahead. So the man came down, the manifestation of God. He arrived here on the scene, and he promptly made his birth with the pigs with the swine, and he ate at the trough with them. After a while, he got good and sick and tired of it. He realized what a rat race he was living in. He realized the misery that was possible in this world, and he decided that that was never the plan of God, that he should live that way. So what did he do? He said, I will return unto my father's house. And the father killed the fatted calf and put a golden chain around his neck and welcomed him back home. And this is the process that we are now experiencing, a matter of the linkage with the golden age that is to come. And you and I are to make it. We have a lot of gurus in India. We have gurus in the Himalayas. We have the ancient Vedic system that has existed for thousands of years. And according to that, the disciple sits before the guru and the guru gives him the mantra and he sits there and says the mantra and so he experiences personal salvation. But in the golden age, God will say to a man, this is your vine and this is your fig tree. And every man will be able to sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and he can be his own guru. He can be his own spiritual teacher. He can identify with God or the masters. He can have the assistance of the masters, the same as today. But he will be able to sit under his own vine and his own fig tree, and he will be given the great revelations of life that he needs and requires to live. The golden age is coming. The beginning of the golden age is now. At the beginning of any age, you do not see what is in store for that age unless you're a prophet. <laughs> and so, in effect, we are all here who hold the gift of prophecy in order to explain that the fact that the world has degenerated to its present state of misery producing 
where you have so much misery and affliction being leveled on the whole human race. You have wars and rumors of war. You have financial crises all over the world. You have abundance in the world, and yet you have famine. You have misery in South America, undreamed of by most of you who live in this particular segment of the hemisphere. You have great wisdom living side by side with great ignorance. And you have manipulation in the public school system that the graduates themselves are unaware of. They are being manipulated from the time they're in the second and third grade. I went into the school where my son was going, the public school. He was in the fourth grade there. And this was last year when he was in the third grade. And I opened up a book of social studies. And I'm not even going to tell you, I might excite you too much, what I read in that book on social studies. But I saw the brainwashing tactics that were being employed in this country and to our children that were paving the way for the time when great destruction would come to our land because of the bad preparation and training which our teachers, the teachers that you and I are paying, are giving to our children and our children's children. Isn't that something? And yet it's going on and happening now. It is now. So there is a great need in the coming age for a series of private schools that will be sponsored by the masters and that will effectively train your children according to ascended master precepts without necessarily calling them that. Because you have too much prejudice in the world today against anything that is truly constructive, and too much snobbery and egotism, which is based upon a false sense of security, a false sense of human values and wealth. We have successfully created such a school in Colorado Springs. We have around 50 children that are attending our little school. We utilize the Montessori system. And in addition to the Montessori system, we supplement that with Ascended Master training according to the desires of the parents. The school is open not only to members of our church with children, but also to other people in Colorado Springs. At the present time, we are happy to tell you we are experiencing a great deal of faith in our school by those of every faith and every religion. For we have probably less than 10% of our school that is made up of church members, the rest being other members of the community. And strange as it may seem, some of the people who are sending children to our school are now attending the Summit Lighthouse Church and participating in our services to the masters. So you can see the value, can you not, of a school for the new age, where you get right down to the nitty gritty and you start with the young people at the age that they are what we may call unspoiled. When they are little, six and seven, why, here they were last year going to indoctrinate my son with certain phases of social studies. And so this year, his daddy grabbed the string and pulled him right out of the school. And so now he goes to our school rather than to the public school. No, the word that was and is is relevant to us at the time we live upon earth. Right now. What is now? What is important now? That you and I understand who we are and what we're going to do about it. We can either be puppets, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, you know, just 
gyrate around before the television screen of life, or we can be in command and have an opportunity to express who and what we are. And I believe that it is important and utterly unforgivable if we have an opportunity to know something about the master's plans and intent, and then we don't do anything about it. The word, that which was and is and shall be. We, in effect, are magic lanterns, you and I. We have light shining through us, all of us. But we make the pictures we put in our magic lanterns. We make every picture. Sometimes we have a little help from the masters in making these pictures. And then again, we have a little help from people we better not have help from. From the dark side. They come along and they try to inoculate us and control the making of our pictures. And when we get our pictures made, we put them in the magic lantern, and God's light shines through that lantern. And lo, the world that will be appears before our gaze. We see to the right. We see through the right. The divine intent, what we are making, what we are creating today, what we are creating for our tomorrows becomes apparent to us. I think one of the great problems is that when a boy or a girl is uh, growing up at first, they don't really understand that they won't live forever in that body. Do you know what I mean? You understand? I mean, when you're 16, you're sweet 16, you've never been kissed. Probably never been missed either, because you've never been kissed. But anyway, you come to that particular age, 16, and you believe you're going to live forever. And a man or a woman of 30, oh, I'm telling you, they're very old. And when they get to be 40 or 50, they're gray and faded and probably won't last very long. But we're actually today, people are lasting quite a while thanks to the new vitamin therapies and all the new surgical techniques and and all of the facelifting and done in Hollywood and everything, why people seem to live forever. At least I think that a lot of our people are living forever. I, I see some of you that you were close to 80 when I first started working here with this group, and I don't know how old you are now, and I don't dare to ask you. But you sure don't look a great deal different, if any. So we must have some secrets here in the master's training. We are creators, and we are creating the future. Now, some people say, well, I mean, this is kind of hidden under a bushel, because what is happening inside of people doesn't always show. I've often thought that people should come to a class with a big circle and wear it on them, you know, and say, I'm a farmer, Another person should say, I'm a housewife. Another should say, I'm a printer. Another should say, I'm a bricklayer. You know, and tell what you are. But would that really tell what you are because it told your craft? Of course it wouldn't. Some of you are magnificent people in the field of human development. You have tremendous potential. And some of you, in the world to come, either the world of tomorrow or the world of your next life, I don't know whether it's going to happen in this life or in the next life, you're going to be great leaders, both in political, religious, and social work. That's very important. Some of it will be in cultural fields. But you people are preparing. A lot of people look at some of the older people that come to the class and they say, what are those old fogies doing over there? They're probably only going to live next year or the year after that. And there they are coming to those classes and sitting there and trying to learn how to control their vitality and their breathing and everything else, you know. What are they doing it for? Well, dear hearts, if you thought that you were just going to stop and the spring was all run down and you were never going to wind it again, that would be a little different. But most of you already know that you're going to wind that spring. God is going to wind the spring. 
And you're going to spring up and you're going to take your place in the world of tomorrow as you ought to. And so, if only all of you would get this sense that each day is a day when you are mapping your future. You're drawing the pictures of life that are what you want, what your desires are. But you know something most people are saying, especially in our work, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And so some people have the wrong idea about this and they say, well, I just leave everything to God. You understand what I mean? They just say, I'm going to leave everything to God. I'm not going to do anything. Whatever he wants me to be, I'll be. It doesn't work that way because God is leaving it to you. <laughs> that's the whole thing. and That's the whole problem. See, God is leaving it to you. He left you a legacy. He left you the ability. He left you tremendous potential. But the utilization of that potential is up to each and every one of you. That which was and that which is and that which shall be. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. If we would only understand that it took the same energy and the same word from God to make you that it took to make Christ. And if you just think about that, you would realize what your potential is. The word that was, he didn't just make Christ. He could be a prototype of us all, but we're all supposed to become that. Isn't it wonderful when you stop and think about it? Isn't it glorious when you stop and think about it? It's beautiful. But what do we find people doing? They have to style themselves and stylize themselves. They have to think that their life consists of outer raiment, of what they put on or what they eat or where they go or what club they belong to. Try belonging to the Great White Brotherhood. You can't join it, did you know that? You can't ever join the Great White Brotherhood. Every once in a while, we hear of someone saying, join the Great White Brotherhood. In fact, we have a very dear soul that puts an ad in a magazine, donates to the summit every month, and in that ad he always says, join the Great White Brotherhood. He's a good man. I'm not finding any fault with him. But the point I'm making here is that you can't really join it because you have to be invited. How does that happen? When the student is ready, the teacher appears. When the time has come, you will be invited. But you may not always know it in your outer mind at first. You may be under tutelage of the masters for years and years and years, drawn and magnetized by the master. And all at once you realize that you have been tutored. It all becomes clear to you now. But for what? For a wonderful plan. For a wonderful place. In the world of today. In the world of action. Can you tell me that just as that woman that was getting on the bus had need for her bus fare, that there's not many people in the world today that don't have need for these teachings? Can you tell me that there are not many people today that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and other places, commit suicide every year, and there are thousands of them, and a lot of them are high school and college students? Can you tell me that there's no need to work with those people, that there's no need to spread the teachings? Why, of course there's a need. Can you tell me that the purposes of civilization are not served by these teachings? Of course they are served by these teachings because they put it all in focus. A lot of us here wear glasses. Anybody that's ever worn glasses, whether they're contacts or, or regular glasses, knows that the optometrist sits there and he sticks all kinds of discs in front of your eyes and throws everything out of focus. And after a while, he says, how does this one work? You say, well, I see, that's a little better than the other one. He says, just a minute, I'll try something else. And he turns a little gadget 
And then you look and it gets clearer still. Well, that's the way it is with the teaching. The teachings are to clear up man's understanding of himself and of life. If life isn't the most wonderful thing that ever happened to you, then you don't see clearly. The blind follow the blind, and they all fall into the ditch. But it doesn't happen that way with the masters. The masters know where they're going, where they came from, and why they do everything. Do you? Or do you act from this position of just vain desire? You have a whimsy, you have a feeling you'd like to do something, say, let's go. Let's go, let's do this. So, dear hearts, the most beautiful tomorrow is being made today right here for you. And I want to warn every one of you that it's very important that you hear all that the masters have to say because the masters will put it in shape for you. They'll tell it as it is. And when they're through and you begin to think about it and pray about it and ask the eternal creator about it, when it all falls into shape and perspective, you're going to say, I'm glad that I participated in that because this is the life that is, that was, and that shall be. Thank you very much, and God bless you.